Title lesson is not even death will separate us. Romans 8. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors Amen. through him who loved us. Amen. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, and the church said, Amen. Amen. This is a powerful scripture, isn't it? Yeah, it's awesome. To know that the love of God is invincible. That nothing in all creation will separate us from God's love. Isn't that intense? Amen. God is faithful. God never changes. And God will always be loyal to us, no matter what. Amen. Come on, Mike. It never ends. God is never unfaithful. That's right. Isn't that awesome? That is. And here, this is a, a powerful, powerful thing. Because it means that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That means nothing can stop us because nothing can stop our relationship with God. There's nothing that will stop God from caring about us. There's nothing that will separate us from God's love. He will always love us. He will always care about us. His love will never, ever, ever, ever change. Amen. Now, does this mean that we're all guaranteed to be with God for eternity? Absolutely not. Because there is still something that can change where we're at with God. Yep. Our faithfulness to Him. Yep, that's right. God's faithfulness unchanging. Our faithfulness, that's the question. Will we remain faithful? So here in a sense, God will never change, will never be separated from His love. His love will always remain the same. But what about our love for God? That's what we really got to be concerned about. Yeah. Yeah. And so here, we're going to study one thing, one time, and focus on it, where man was separated from God. Come on, bro. Let's go to Genesis 3. Come on, Mike. Come on, Mike. Mike. It's awesome, bro. Preach it, bro. Come on. This is awesome, Mike. Genesis 3. It's the fall of man. Verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. And said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you'll die. You'll not surely die. The serpent said to him. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, 
She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. So we'll stop right there. Now, here is intense because we see man separate from God. There is something trying to separate us from God. Yep. Satan. Yep. Satan is attacking and Satan is going after our relationship with God and destroying it for a purpose to separate us. Right. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. And so as you read right here, you see God walking along humble, happy in the garden. And yet there's a problem. Eve and Adam are separated. And they're scared and they're hiding from God. And because of that, you see why, why did it happen? Because Satan separated them. Wow. See, just because nothing will separate God's love from us does not mean that there is not a spiritual battle for your soul to separate you from God. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And so now we see there is a battle, a spiritual battle to rip you away, yeah. right. to pull you away, and to say to get you away from God is Satan's desire. Yeah, wow. And he has been doing it from the very beginning, guys. Yeah. Yeah. It was the fall of man, and let me tell you something, it hasn't changed even to this day. Yeah. Talk about it, bro. Come on, Mike. Satan comes up to the woman, and what does he do? He says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? <laughs> now, is that what God said? Nope. No. no, that's not what God said. Yeah. But guess what Satan is? More crafty than anything else. You got that right. Mm -hmm. He says, man, God is so unfair. You're in this awesome garden with all these trees. And God says, you can't eat any of them. The woman says, no, he didn't say that. But he did say we can't eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. And we can't eat its fruit. Or you'll die. And what does Satan say? You'll not surely die. Because God knows when you eat it, you're going to be just like him. And you're no good for evil. And so the woman sees it, she says, maybe he's right. Maybe God's trying to, to hurt me and, and, and he doesn't have my best wishes in mind. And so he doesn't want me to eat from any tree in the garden. It does look good. It's pleasing to the eye and, and it looks good for food. And if I eat it, I can even be like God himself. Come on. This sounds awesome. Mm, I want this. What happens? She grabs it. She eats it. And Satan has won. In the end, verse 21, or verse 22, it says, And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Right. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which 
he had been taken. So here, they broke God's command. They ate the tree that they weren't supposed to eat from. And now what happens? They're forbidden to eat from the tree that they really needed. And the tree of life is now cut off. Wow. And now there's no more immortality. Adam and Eve will later die. That disobedience to God has led to death. Is that intense? They weren't ever supposed to die. Death is not naturally supposed to be what we do. But death has become the destiny of us all because of the fall of man. Yeah. Because that tree of life was cut off from Adam and Eve. Isn't that intense? Yep. And so now we all inherit physical death from this decision of Adam and Eve to sin against God. And now we've inherited physical death from Adam and Eve. Wow. And we too will die just like they did. Unless God comes back before us. Now, has this pattern changed? Let's go to James chapter 1. Come on, bro. Come on, Mike. Come on, Mike. James right after Hebrews, near the end of the Bible. But keep your place in Genesis 3. We'll be going back there. But it's easy to find, right? Come on, bro. Be a thing. Okay. Verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So, amen? You see that in the garden right there? Yeah. Was God tempting Eve? No. no. Satan was. Okay. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he's dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. James lays out the progression that leads to hell, to spiritual death. For Adam and Eve, it led to physical death. And so here we see the progression or stages of death. What happens to lead somebody to hell for eternity? Isn't this intense? You kind of got to pick it apart so that you know where you're at possibly in this same progression. And you see, you ask the question, okay, what's the first step? Oh, well, that's easy. Evil, you know, evil desires, right? No, no, that's, that's the cause. If you know English at all. It says, each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, yeah. here's what happens. Evil desire, sinful nature, is a fact of every person's life. We all have it. Yeah. Even in the church, we all have a sinful nature yeah. that we are in battle against. Yeah. That's right. So Great. nobody here is perfect and better than anybody else. We Not all better. are in battle against our sinful natures. Yep. Yeah. And so let's look at what happens though. What is the very first step? Your sinful nature causes the first step, which is what? Dragged away and then enticed is the second one. Did this happen with Eve in the garden? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Satan comes. Yep. Says, did God really tell you you can't eat from any tree in the garden of Eden? See, Satan was attacking Eve's relationship with God. Yep. Yep. And trying to drag her away from God right there. Did God really say that? Of course, what was the real answer? No. God didn't say that. But what is Satan trying to do to drag her away? After you get dragged away, the next stage happens, which is enticement. Enticement is just putting something right there. 
this. That looks good, doesn't it? That's what Satan does. Hey. With Eve, what was it? With that fruit, it offers this to Check that out. And there's the enticement. Now, we can understand this because, you know, imagine putting, have you ever seen a dog and you just put some food in front of them? Oh, yeah. I mean, they're going crazy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and literally, you can see in their mind. There's one word: food, 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 food. Yeah. It's almost like they just got hypnotized by that little piece of food. Yeah. They could be doing anything, but oh, they just get take it out. Yeah. You entice a dog by food, and the dog now has moved on past enticement to the next stage, which is what. It says, each one is tempted by his own evil desire. He's dragged away to enticed. Then after desire has conceived. Desire is the next step. What is the dog? The dog sees the food and then what happens? The dog wants the food, right? You guys know what I'm talking about here. Yeah. Yep. You ever sat at a table with some really good food? Yes. And a dog is just like, <laughs> Man, this dog, this dog is doing everything it knows how in its possibility, its its ability to be able to get food. Yeah. Sometimes dogs know the only thing I can do is look super cute. Yeah. 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 But you know, deep in that dog's mind, what's going on? Food. 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 Give me food. Give me food. Up, up, food. 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 Up, what's that? No, food. That's what a dog thinks. For us, guys, we're no different. Yeah. That's right. Satan puts something out in front of you, and then you start wanting it. Yeah. Yep. And then in every little action, somehow, some way, it, it leads to that desire. Yeah. When we want something, do we know how to make it happen? Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, there's people walking around with $800 phones that have trouble even buying food for a day. That's true. <laughs> yeah. You think, man, you really desire that phone a little bit more than food right there. When we want something, we make it happen. And so, sometimes a brother's like, yeah, I was, you know, oh, I don't, I don't know what happened. I, I was in the bathroom and then I looked at a picture on my phone and oh man, I just blew it. It's easy. You wanted it to happen. You desired sin and you figured out a way to make it happen. That's right. And you can even excuse yourself and say, well, I deserve it just this once. I've been so good for God. Whoa. Wow. Or you say, well, you know, but that brother, he's so mean to me. And so I'm just gonna look at a picture real quick. Uh. Or man, but that, that person is just, they sinned. And so now I'm gonna do this. So, isn't that interesting though? Yep. That somebody's sin leads you to get what you finally desired. It wasn't that sin that caused it, it was your desire that caused That's it. That's right. Yeah. Yep. And desire leads to what? Sin. Yeah. Desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of times people are like, yeah, it wasn't me, it's just, you know, it's just what happened to me that led me to impurity. It's just what happened to me that led me to drugs. It's just what happened to me that led me to getting angry and cursing. No, it's, it's what you wanted. Yeah. Yep. It's what you desired. And because of that, it happened. I mean, it's not like, you know, it's crazy. I was just, this guy sinned against me and then I went and I robbed a bank and killed a lady. And it wasn't my fault. It's just, he sinned against me. What am I supposed to do? Like, no, no, no. You don't resort to that because that's not what you want to do. You know what I mean? And you say, you know, I, I, I was so angry. I killed a dog this morning. I say, wait a minute. No, you, you don't confess. When was the last time you confessed that? <laughs> Never, probably. Why? Because you don't naturally want to kill dogs. Right. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Come on, Mike. But when you say, oh, yeah, I was just jacked up, and then boom, I just fell into masturbation. No, no, no. You don't just, oh, it just happens. Yeah. 
it's you wanted it to happen. You desired sin and now Satan gave you the enticement and now you made up the excuse because you wanted it to happen. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. We got to be very clear. Sin happens because we want it to happen. You got that right. Not just because it just fell in our laps and boom, I sinned. Oh, whoops. No. Yep. You were in, dragged away from God, enticed, and then you desired sin and you finally got what you wanted. Yeah. Right. Yep. Don't be deceived. It came from your sinful nature. Yep. You led yourself there. You walked down the same path that Eve walked down mm. and you fell into the same trap they fell into as well. Yep. Don't be deceived. And the first problem is denial. You're the problem. Talk about it, bro. Come on, Mike. Don't hold back. And you need to see what Satan is trying to do. He wants you to finally die. He wants you to be destroyed. But it's a process. And the very first step is to drag you away from God. Where is your relationship with God at, even from this morning? You know, the first problem with Eve is she thought she could make it without God. Do you think you can make it without God? Did you wake up distracted by the worries of the day? and you didn't devote the time you needed with the Lord? Is your relationship with God weak and distant? Well, you need to see where you're at in the process of death and hell and darkness. You're getting dragged away. And guess what happens once you get dragged away? You get enticed. Let's go back to Genesis 3. Oh, my. Help us out, Mike. You better go ahead. Come on, Mike. Actually, real quick, sorry, go back to James 4. I missed the scripture. It's all right, bro. We with you. Even better, bro. Lay us out. <laughs> Verse 4 of James 4. It says, You adulterous people. Isn't that intense? Yes. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Wow. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. That's why scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Amen. Amen. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Come near to God, and He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and He will lift you up. Right. You know, it says, submit yourself to God, then. And then it says, resist the devil, and what happens? He flees from you. Did Eve resist Satan? No, you don't see any resistance. You actually see a discussion. And when we start entertaining thoughts of Satan, worldly thoughts, thoughts of the world, guess what we become? An enemy of God. We become adulterous. Why? Because God is faithful. And the only person unfaithful in a relationship with God is the other person. Yeah. Not right. God himself. That's right. right. God doesn't say, yeah, I just don't know about that decision I made with you and uh, I'm going to have to go back on that one. No, that's not God. It's us that struggles with adultery towards God. Is that intense? And it says, if you would just resist Satan, he would flee. What does resisting look like? You ever thought of this one? Like resisting means you say no, right? But is resistance saying no once? No. No, you say no again. Exactly. Right. And is twice resisting? No. No, you're going to have to say no again. And then probably again after that. Amen. And then again. And then maybe like five to ten or maybe even twenty more times. Yeah. But finally, if you keep resisting, what's going to happen? Satan's out. 
See, really, here's the awesome thing. You can overcome sin if you just keep saying no. That's right. Isn't that awesome? Yep. It's only a matter of time before Satan takes off. But you have the ability to overcome by one easy, simple thing, saying no to Satan. Imagine if Eve would have just kept saying, no, Satan, you're wrong. Nope, wrong. Don't want to hear it. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> and what happens, say it's out of there. He's gone. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Do you have this conviction with the sin that's plagued your life? Come on. Come on, Do you walk with God and understand Satan is going to try to drag me away, but I need to say, no, 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 no. I'm going to stay close with God. Where is your conviction at? Where are you at in your life? Or is he dragging you away and he's putting that sin in front of you and enticing you? See, God says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. Isn't that awesome? Man. We have a promise from God. When you get close to God, then God says, you're invincible. I'm with you too. Amen. See, it all goes back to the first step. Don't get dragged away. Amen. Amen. Right? I want to plead with you. If you're in any other part of this stage, whether you desire sin and you know it, and you're like, man, I just want it so bad. I don't know if I want to be a disciple anymore. Then guess where you're at? You're at the very end of this stage. Mm -hmm. you're, at the very, you're one stage away from death. Yep. When that's your heart. And the only way to fight is to say, I'm going back to my relationship with God. Right. I'm going back on, to my right. walk with God. Yep. I'm going back to what it was all about in the beginning. Yep. I'm going to be close to my Lord. I'm going to love him more than anything else. And I'm not going to allow anything to get in the way between me and him. His love for me never fails. Amen. Right. And so I never want to get dragged away from that love. Right. And that is the battle that we face daily. Right. Because Satan wants to drag you away. Does God really care about you? I mean, does he really have good plans for your life? Really? I mean, look at your life right now. I mean, if God had good plans, why would you be where you're at right now? I mean, does he want you to eat from, he won't let you eat from any tree in the garden? There's something wrong in your life. God doesn't care about you. You're wasting your time. Hey, I got an idea. Check this out. Check the world. Wow, the world. Oh, man. <coughs> they look so happy. <coughs> and I'm not happy with God, but the world's so happy. Mm. I want the world. I desire the world. I want to be like everybody else. No problems. They look so happy. <coughs> it looks so good. That relationship, that impurity, that greed, it's so good. I'm going after it. I'm not going to be committed to God anymore. Dang. And if you don't repent, sin gives birth to death. That's right. If this doesn't make you afraid of being far from God, then you're gonna have to learn your lesson sooner or later. That's right. Yeah. Are you afraid to be far from God? What do you think? Do you constantly think, where am I at with God? Where am I at with God? Are me and God close? You better be close. Or else I'm gonna get taken out. That's how we gotta be thinking. Amen? Amen. Amen, bro. Amen. And when we're close with God, the enticement isn't enticing, right? Right, that's I mean, right. When you're, yeah. when you're full of something, somebody can put any kind of food in front of you and you're like, oh, that's nasty. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? That's right, bro. The Proverbs talks about it. It says, he who is low, he who is full, loathes honey. But to him who is hungry, even what is bitter tastes sweet. 
See, when you're not full with God and full in your relationship with God, then even the bitter things in life start looking good. Wow. That's right. Wow. And so the question is, are you full with God? Mm. You know, when you're after at a buffet, if you're full of after the buffet, I say, hey, hey, you want some of this steak? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, get that away. I'm full. Hey, hey, what about this chocolate cake with whipped cream and ice cream? No, it's nasty. Get that away. But have you ever been so hungry that you've eaten something you promised you never would? Some of you say, I would never eat McDonald's. But then you're so hungry, you go to McDonald's. Come on, Nick. And you walk away and you think, oh, I feel like I just gave into sin right now. And I regret making that decision. What a waste. See, guys, when we're not full with God, that's what we do with sin. We're not full with God and we say, oh, it looks so good. Let me just give it to it. And then afterwards, you're like, that was so stupid. That's right. Why did I do that? I feel so gross. I just, that, what a waste. And guys, when, when we're not full of God, we turn to sin and we feel disgusting about ourselves. That's right, bro. Because we stopped being close to God. We were dragged away from God and we've gotten to something else. Right. Let's go back to Genesis 3. Come on, Mike. You better go ahead, bro. You're doing great. Verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. So here you see a lot of the same things that sin offers. Sin offers its pleasing to the eye. It offers something that looks good. It also is desirable for gaining something that you don't think you have. Right. And so you're discontent and you think you're going to grab something else from it. And, and it's also good for food. I mean, it, it seems like, oh, it's going to taste so good. It's going to fulfill me too. It's, it's, it's delicious. See, sin offers those three things. It looks delicious. It looks good. And it's going to offer you something you don't have. But you got to realize, nope, it's just Satan lying to you. Yeah. And the only way you're going to see that is when you're focused on what God says and not on what Satan says. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. If yep. Eve would have just been focused on the Word of God, Satan would have not trapped him. Yep. And for us, we got to draw near to God by, by being focused on the Bible. Amen? Amen. One thing, when I was in college, I lived in the dorms. And in the dorms is where all the 18 and 19 year olds finally get to do whatever their sinful <laughs> desires want. And I had girls walking into my dorm room in their underwear laying on my bed. And I was a disciple. And you're thinking, man, first get out of my room. But second, this is tough. I was there for two years. Girls would yell out, Mike, I want to have sex with you. Dang. They're like, what the heck? And for a guy who's struggled with impurity his whole life, that's Satan knocking at your door, literally. So guess what I had to do? What you have to do? Focus on God's word. Yeah. And every day I'd read Proverbs 5, the whole chapter. And it says, my son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen well to my words of insight. That's right. That you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she's as bitter as gall and as sharp as a double-edged sword. Wow. And I had the whole, I could go on through the whole chapter, but I'm not going to do it. But I have Proverbs 5 memorized for the rest of my life now. And I had to teach my heart, Heart, you're so jacked up. Heart, you're so stupid. Heart, you think that these sins are going to make you happy? Heart, you're being lied to by Satan right now. They, the adulteress's lips drip honey. 
Her speech is through the oil. But in the end, guess what's gonna happen? Yeah. It's like getting stabbed in the stomach with a knife. I was like, okay, do I really want to get stabbed in the stomach? <laughs> no. It says her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. And so these girls who look so pretty, I just say, but you know where their feet are headed? Straight to hell. All right. And when you look at a beautiful woman who has feet going straight to the grave, you think, let me get away from this, this evil monstrosity created by Satan. <laughs> and so, amen, I stayed pure throughout my college years right there. But Satan didn't give up and he still got me and I fell away later after college. See, even when I resisted Satan, there's a point where he still is waiting for another time to grab me. Right. Yeah. That's right, yep. That's right. But for us guys, we gotta be focused on the word of God. Are you memorizing scriptures that fight against your sinful tendencies? If you're negative, are you memorizing scriptures that can help you overcome negativity? If you're a liar, are you memorizing scriptures that help you to be honest no matter what? Lying is a normal thing. That's why it's in the Bible. But we gotta say, nope, openness is awesome. Yeah. If you're greedy, are you memorizing scriptures that talk about giving up and be trusting in God and not committing idolatry like that? If you're scared of sharing your faith, are you memorizing scriptures that talk about how awesome it is to share your faith? What are you focused on? Are you focused on the word? Amen? Amen. Okay, let's go back to Genesis 3. So this is my mic. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Whoa! Okay. Amen that it explains everything that happened with Eve. But what the heck happened with Adam? You know what I mean? Tell us, Mike. Like, at, basically, all you know is Adam is, here you go, cool. <laughs> like, what the heck? I mean, it, it almost seems like there's no process whatsoever, right? But there is a process. There is. It's the same thing. He sinned and it led to death for him as well. Yep. So here we gotta take a step back. Okay, we found the sin part. He disobeyed God. It led him to death. But what was the desire and the enticement and what dragged him away? Well, it was Eve saying, do this. And he wanted to please his wife. And so he sinned. That's crazy. Isn't that intense? Adam was a people pleaser. Adam cared what his wife thought. There was no other people to please at the time. There was only one other person in his life, and he blew it by being a people pleaser with the other person that existed on the Wow. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that intense? Yeah. Even with two people, people pleasing can cause you to fall away from God. Wow. Uh oh. Wow. That's so intense. And so he doesn't want to say, wait a minute. No! God said we can't do that. Says, okay, whatever. Don't wanna don't wanna upset anybody. And boom, he's now separated from God as well. Let's look at Proverbs 29. That was good, bro. Help us out. Well, like, <laughs> go there, bro. Twenty-nine, verse twenty-five. It says, "Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe." Man, that's intense, guys. Yeah. Being a people pleaser traps us. Well, how? Well, first of all, 
other people want to sin, and if we're not standing up for God, we're going to follow them right straight into the same path. So at your job, are you trying to be like the people you work with or be like God? If you're trying to be like everybody you work with, guess where you're headed? Straight to sin. What about with your family that aren't disciples, that aren't focused on obeying the word of God? Do you care what they think? Are you afraid of their thoughts about you? If you are, that is going to lead you straight to hell. Yeah. Because they're headed towards sin, and that might be you as well. Where are you at? Fear of man traps. Let's look at John chapter 3. Come on. Come on, Mike. Verse 19. It says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come to light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes to light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. This is intense, guys. You got darkness and light. But what keeps somebody in darkness? They're afraid. Yeah. They're afraid right. to talk about their life. Yeah. They're afraid to get open. They're afraid to expose their deeds. Yep. And so they choose darkness. Mm. Right. Wow. Right. Because they're afraid of people's thoughts. Yeah. Man, Man. that is so stupid. Yeah. Yeah. To sacrifice salvation so that you can keep this fake exterior before everybody as right. if you're a good Come person. On. Right. You're here in this group. Let me tell you something. We already know as disciples, you're evil and you have sin in your life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're not fooling anybody. Yep. And the person who says, no, I'm good. I'm, I'm good to go. <coughs> no impurity here. Wow. Uh, oh, great. Now I know you're lying to me too. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, my. Come on, bro. Now I know you're a coward. Mm. Right. Now I know you're afraid of people's thoughts. Wow. Now I know you don't even care about pleasing God. So when a disciple doesn't confess sin, I think, okay, now I know about probably four sins going on. <laughs> that person does not look good. That person looks even more evil. And I'm like, okay, dude, please repent. Please talk about your sin before you're gone. You know what, I'm, do you relate to that? Yeah. 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 Yep. Talk about it, bro. You know, one thing is we want to look good in front of people and so we don't talk about our sin. We think, oh, I'm in leadership. I can't talk about my sin or else I get taken out. Wow. And so we don't expose our sins. But the interesting thing is when we talk about our sins, that's actually when you do better. Yeah, yeah that's right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Somebody who doesn't talk about their sins never can even grow as a leader. Wow. And honestly, the person who's leading you knows you're hiding your sin and they're like, okay. Until you get open about your sin, I cannot <coughs> trust you with a Bible talk. Right. You know what I mean? Yep. Somebody who's perfect cannot be entrusted with a Bible talk. Because you know they're lying. Right. Yeah. Does that make right. sense? Yeah. Somebody who's open about their entire life, you can trust. Because now you know they want help and they're going to repent. So, even for you that aspire to leadership, let's just get it out there. If you're not open about your life, you're never going to grow. So you might as well start talking about all your sin. Amen? And then people will trust you and you'll be able to leave. Does that make sense? You are not the expert in how to grow and become a leader. And if you think you figured it out by acting perfect, man, you are way off. Yeah. Way off. Amen? So here, I want to encourage you. If you want to be in the light, you need to be open about your sin. And if you're a disciple who even wants to be a leader, you got to be open about your sin. Yeah. And if you're a leader who's leading and you want to grow and you want to help the kingdom, you got to be open about your sin. And if you want to be close to God, stop being a people pleaser and talk about your sin. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's awesome. I could use a few more amens. Amen. Right? Amen. 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 See, you're not fooling anybody by not talking about your life. And all you're going to do is hurt more and more and more people until you eventually get taken out yourself. Wow. And just talk, no matter how bad it is, guys, it's not the worst. Right. Even if you murdered somebody, it's not as bad as it could be. 
Amen. Amen. Okay. More mic. Finally, let's close it off and go to Revelation 22. Finish here. Verse one says. Now remember, you gotta you gotta think of this in relation to Genesis three. <laughs> Who took Adam and Eve out of the garden? God did. And if you would read later, you see that angels basically blocked the way back to the tree of life. There was a flaming sword that blocked the tree of life from Adam and Eve. Is that intense? And you gotta imagine how hard that must have been for Adam and Eve. To be in the garden and now God's angel is blocking the tree. You can see it, but you can never touch it ever again. And you see the, the, the flaming sword and the angel guarding it and you just say, that's what I deserve. Yeah. Is that intense? Yeah. Uh, and just the, the sadness and the regret of your sin, all because you listened to Satan and you disobeyed God. And that tree of life is blocked. All right, now with that in mind, read Revelation 22. Last chapter of the Bible. So the beginning, the fall of man, and here's how the Bible ends. Verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river, stood the tree of life, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They'll see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. There will not, they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Then the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. So here, this man is led to the city by who? The angel. The angel who probably blocked the tree of life is now bringing man back to the same tree. Amen. And saying, look, here it is. God has erased the curse. He's brought people back to salvation. Doesn't that encourage you? Yes. To know that God has resolved the issue. Man sinned, and God has allowed us to come back to the tree of life through the water of life. Amen. That's awesome. And now that water of life shows us those trees, and now we're allowed to eat again from the, the tree of eternal life. <clears throat> And of course, we know you enter the kingdom through baptism, through the water, <coughs> through forgiveness of sins that comes through the washing of your sins, through baptism. <coughs> Eternal life offered once again. Amen? Amen. Amen. Verse 17, it says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. <laughs> See, God says, I've done it. I've wiped away the sin. I've brought back the tree. And it's not the angel blocking you anymore. Now it's the angel bringing you back to it. And the angel saying, hey, the doors are open and it's a free gift of eternal life. That's awesome. And so here, we see the galactic battle, Satan, battling for our souls to be separated. And God saying, just put me first. 
and you'll be able to walk with me and eat from the eternal tree of salvation. And in this, where do you stand with God? Are you seeking God with all your hearts? Do you want to repent and be baptized so you can eat from the tree of life? Do you want to put God first in your life? God says, hey, it's a free gift. But just don't get dragged away. Don't act like a dog and get enticed and start desiring what Satan's trying to feed you. Desire me. And wouldn't that be cool if dogs had that same kind of heart? Yeah. I just trust really my cool. master and love my master. And my master will feed me when he wants to feed me, but I just love him. But instead you always think, no, that dog probably just wants some food. I don't know if he really loves me or not. And God says, hey, don't worry about everything else. Just love me. We can make a decision to love God over everything else. Amen, guys? Amen. And Satan will be destroyed because God has paid the price for us. In 1 Corinthians 6, it says God has paid the price through his blood. Let's go over there real quick. Come on, Mike. Come on, Mike. Verse 19. It says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. See, when, when we come in contact with Jesus' blood at baptism, the price is finally being paid for our souls. You are being bought by God. Is that intense? Yeah. So guess what that means? Whose do you belong to? You're not yours anymore. Let go of your life. Because you already gave it up when you got baptized. You were bought at a price. And so God said, hey, I laid it all out for you. Will you stay faithful to me? Nothing will separate us. Nothing will get in our way unless you turn back on our marriage covenant. God is never unfaithful to us. Therefore, the only person that commits adultery in a relationship with God is the other person. God says, I paid for you with my blood. I said, not even death will do us part. We're together for eternity. Is that intense? God paid the price. And here it's our job to say, amen, God. I will never turn away from you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never leave you. No matter how hard it gets, I know your promise is true. And Satan will not get between us. I won't be enticed anymore. I won't desire the world anymore. I'll get open about my sin. I'll walk with you. Amen, guys? Yeah. And as we take communion right now, that's what that communion symbolizes. The price paid for you. The blood and body of Jesus. And you're eating the very price symbolized in the sacrifice of God's Son. Is that awesome? Yeah. You're remembering the marriage covenant as a disciple you made when you were baptized. And so now you get to take it and say, forever. Nothing will separate us. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father God, thanks so much for buying us. God, thanks so much for protecting us. Thanks so much for just wanting to have a relationship with us. God, I pray that we can walk, Father, in the light, and Father, never get dragged away from you by Satan. God, help us to walk with you and be close to you, God. We love you. Father, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
Genesis 4. 